I'm not preaching today. Um, Mr. Mike Drury, the Reverend Pastor Father Mike Drury is with us today. Some of you know Mike, and, and he's far less formal than any of those titles, so I'm being a little silly. But uh, have any of you ever been to Pine Hills Church in Fort Wayne? A lot of folks. Okay, so you probably know Mike, so he's well known. And um, if you don't know, uh, Mike is the pastor. He's been there for 18 years. You remind me in the first service. Uh, he and his wife Lillian, who's with him as well, are here today to celebrate nine years with us, but to bring a really encouraging word. Mike has been such an encouragement to me. And I shared with our team this morning at our team huddle, we have every Sunday at 8.30, just to pray and to begin to worship. Um, I told them that a lot of the things, I would say most of the things that I do well as a pastor, I learned from this guy right here. I got to sit under his teaching every Sunday. I, just, I got to sit and watch him lead in staff meetings and elder meetings. I got to sit in on counseling meetings. Um, I, we sat together one time. He asked me into his office to meet with a, a, a lady who was planning her own funeral, who, who knew that uh, treatment had run its course and that she was not going to be um, around much longer. And so I got to sit and watch him lead in a meeting like that, which is very, very challenging. And I learned a lot. So a lot of the good things that I do as a pastor you can thank him. And the things about me as a pastor that you don't like, talk to Mike. Quit bothering me with it, okay? Leave your emails. I'll give you Mike's email when you leave. Send in, take it up with him. Mike, I'm thankful for you to be here. Why don't you come on up? Uh, would you guys welcome Mike Drury? Thank you for being here, brother, and being a, a, a pastor, friend, spiritual father to me as well. So here you go. Well, it really is truly an honor to be here. So a uh, quick story, a uh, memory that I have, a couple of them are uh, when we were looking to hire, uh, our current worship pastor at the time told me about Pastor Mark and av availability and maybe we could uh, talk about coming on staff. One of our first conversations took place over sushi. And we actually met, and I bet Mark could probably still tell you exactly what that sushi was that we had See, there he goes. I'm telling you, it was unforgettable, and not because of the conversation, but because of the sushi. But, uh, man, just from that, I just think about from that point on to here we are today, and, man, I just stand in front of you today just a humbled and honored, uh, proud father, if you will, and just Mark so proud of you uh, and, and Chelsea. And I will tell you when uh, Mark and Chelsea, we had had some ongoing conversations, but when he approached and said, like, hey, um, I really feel like we're called to plant a church. Uh, when we announced it to the church body at Pine Hills, it was not a shock in any way, shape, or form. The vast majority of people responded with, well, of course, we were just waiting for that. Everybody could see the growth in Mark in his pastoral leadership. It just seemed like the next logical step that he, that, that he was moving into that. So it was with joy to celebrate that. And then about 10 years ago... Um, I, I want to share this with you. This is, a, this is one of my most memorable multiplication ministries as a pastor of a church that's planted a number of churches over the years. Uh, so one of the ways that, that we approach church planning is to try and identify the communities where we feel like the Spirit is at work and then pray through and we have a whole series of things that we do to try and say, is this where the Spirit is inviting us to come join where He is already at work? So we had started the journey, Mark, you guys had started the journey with what we call a TAP team that identifies a number of cities and then over the course of weeks narrows it down. We had narrowed it down to two cities uh, where we felt like possibly God was calling us to plant, and it was either Auburn or Kendallville. And on the day that we announced that to the church body at Pine Hills Church, unbeknownst to us, there was a group of people that had come down from Kendallville. Now, they didn't know that we were in that process or making that announcement. I didn't know that they were there. So we stood up and we had this conversation with the church body and said, hey, we've narrowed it down to two places, Auburn and Kendallville. Would you please be in prayer that God would really give through the Spirit leading and direction where we should plant? And... Um, after the service, a group of people, we got connected, and I still can see us standing in the hallway with a group of people from Kendallville um, with excitement, and I, I vividly remember a couple of people with some tears running down their face and just saying, would you please come to Kendallville? And here we are 10 years later, and what God is doing here is absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. And I just want you to know, yes, absolutely. And I want you to know 
Like this, this is typically isn't normal. The vast majority of church plants don't survive longer than three to five years tops. So to be nine years in and not just surviving, but actually thriving and growing, um, God is at work here, and it is a joy and an honor to join with you and Mark to have watched this growth in you uh, and your pastoral leadership. Man, I just celebrate you. It's a joy to know you and to watch God working in you. And Miss Chelsea, you are an amazing, amazing pastor's wife. We'll call her the First Lady of Fairview today, shall we? First Lady of Fairview. And uh, it has just been a joy. And I know I shared this the first service, but I just want to encourage you and encourage the body that one of the things I so appreciate about you is the temptation is, as a pastor's wife, to try and please everybody and do what everybody wants you to do. And that's probably the worst thing that you could do. And the best thing you could do is just find your place in the church like everybody else where you love to serve, be who you are, and just do that. And you have done that absolutely tremendously. So it has been a joy and honor to watch you grow in your platform and all that God has given to you. So we love my wife and I love you too dearly and are honored to celebrate with you today. Amen. So long before I was a pastor, um, God has given me a couple of other hats to wear long before he called me to pastor. So 32 years ago, I stepped in or put on a hat called husband. And so I am honored to have my wife Lillian of 32 years and some change now with us today. So Lillian, thank you for joining today. Can I embarrass you again and have you stand up for the church by just instead of seeing the back of your hair to just to see you. This is my wife Lillian. Thank you so much for being here sweetly. Then, God also chose to, to let me wear a couple of hats, not once, not twice, but three times over. I have three children that I'd like you to meet them via uh, picture. So, in the middle is Zachary. He's our oldest. He's 25 years old now. Uh, Kaylee is then our one daughter. She is 22. She will graduate in April from Indiana Wesleyan University. It looks like she might be heading out to Denver, Colorado to another one of our church plants. So pray for me. My dad heart is excited and crushed all at the same time. Uh, and then Luke is our youngest. He is 19 years old and um, love him dearly. He's actually serving at another church. He's a very good drummer, so he's serving at another church in town today. And uh, if God doesn't have a sense of humor, uh, Luke is a good evidence of that. I am an avid Indiana Hoosier basketball fan. And my, oh, I say one or two people. I'm not, I wasn't a, but my son ended up at Purdue Fort Wayne. So God is good. He keeps me humble all the time. And he keeps threatening he's going to buy me a Purdue sweatshirt. So one of these years, hopefully he will. I will actually wear it. But these are my three kids. And then six months ago, I was able to put on another hat. And this is the grandpa hat. This is our first grandchild, Cyrus Hayes. Um, he turned six months a week or two ago and actually spent the day at the house yesterday. Love him dearly. I thought parenting was good. Grandparenting is next level. It's so much better than parenting. So, again, it's just always good to know maybe a little bit about the person that's going to be sharing with you for the next hour and a half in a message. So, just <laughs> Chelsea, that was good. Just seeing if you're awake, church. Just seeing if you're awake. All right. So, uh, you've been in the Sermon on the Mount. Pastor Mark gave me an option to come preach, like to join where you've been or to do a standalone. I'm like, no, I'm going to join you in the message series that you guys have been in. So, we're going to the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to continue today. So, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to actually look at one of the Beatitudes. You could do a whole series. I actually thought about doing a series on the Beatitudes called Hashtag Blessed. So Mark, don't steal that. Or maybe we could do it together. We could do Fairview and Pine Hills could do that together. But I'm going to focus on one of the Beatitudes. And while you're making your way there, can we agree that food and water are necessary for life? How many of you had any food this morning before you came in? Okay. Anybody have anything to drink before you came in? I won't ask what you had. Okay, good. So a person, literally, a person can survive up to two to three months with just water. But take away food and water, and the body can survive literally just a few days. So I think it's important physically, because we're going to make the analogy spiritually, but physically, food and water are life. They are needed, and they are necessary. Speaking of water... Reminded me of something I heard recently. A wife approached her husband, and she said, hey, I need to tell you something. There's trouble with the car. It has water in the carburetor. Her husband was a little skeptical, and he's like, water in the carburetor? That's ridiculous. She said, no, I'm telling you, I know for a fact there is water in the carburetor. 
He said, honey, you don't even know what a carburetor is. Are you sure? I'm sure. Okay, tell me where's the car. And his wife responded, it's in the pool. So <laughs> making sure you're awake again. Some of you are laughing, and some of you are just staring at me. It's okay. All right, so here's what we're going to do today. As we look at this beatitude from Matthew 5, 6, I want to show you two things. I just try and keep it simple so we can remember and then chew and marinate on it in the week following, right? I want to show you the promise and the provision. In this beatitude that we're going to look at, Jesus makes a promise. Then I want to go to another gospel, and I want to show you where Jesus gives the provision for the promise that he makes. Turn to somebody and say, the promise. <coughs> Turn to somebody else, else and say, the provision. The promise and the provision. All right, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Here's the promise that Jesus made to his hearers immediately on the Sermon on the Mount. I've been to Israel. I've actually stood on a hillside in Israel where it is believed to have possibly been the place. They can't know for sure, but possibly to have been the place where Jesus delivered this sermon. It's beautiful. You can look out. You can see uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, amazing place, if that was actually the place where it happened. As he speaks, he says in Matthew 5, 6, these words and gives a promise. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The promise is actually sort of twofold, is it not? Number one, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed. Blessed, this word literally means happy, fortunate, highly favored. God says those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed. They're fortunate. They're highly favored from God himself. But then he also adds a promise, and that is that when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, like we will be filled. It will happen. In essence, he's saying joy and blessing come from hungering and thirsting for the right things. So immediately, it leads me to ask myself and ask you a question, are you hungry and are you thirsty? And then to add on to that, are you hungry and thirsty for the right things? But here's what's interesting within this promise. I personally find it fascinating that in this verse, Jesus predicates provision with appetite. He predicates provision with appetite. In other words, this is what I'm saying, what I believe Jesus is saying, you and I must be hungry to actually have our hunger satisfied, and we must be thirsty to have our thirst quenched. So in the physical realm, a good appetite indicates good health, and a poor appetite typically is an indication that something is wrong with us. The same analogy holds true for our spiritual appetites. A good appetite for righteousness indicates that spiritually one is in good spiritual condition. It says that the faith of that person is strong and typically healthy. When the spiritual desire is deficient, it reveals potential spiritual weakness and even maybe a lack of maturity, spiritual maturity. It reveals that one's faith could be heading towards being weak and anemic. So this beatitude, this is interesting, this beatitude of Jesus exposes the condition of one's faith. It reveals our spiritual condition and our priorities. So applying this spiritually then, we ask ourselves this question, am I hungry and thirsty for the things of God? Do I have a deep craving, an appetite? Like hunger and thirst are deep cravings, are they not? They're appetites. Do I have an appetite for the things of God? Do I desire the word of God? Do I actually desire the word of God? To desire to read it, to, to desire to dig in. And, you know, the word of God is the only book that when I read it, it actually reads me. The writer of Hebrews uh, would say in Hebrews 4, for the word of God is quick and sharp and powerful than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and, mar and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So like a hunger for the word of God, and even knowing that as I read it, it actually reads me. A hunger for the word to, to join the psalmist who said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A hunger for the word to know that like the psalmist said, like I will hide God's word in my heart that I might not sin against me. Do I hunger? Do you hunger? Do you desire and thirst for the word of God? 
Do you desire the Spirit of God? Like the Spirit of God that's been placed within us. The Spirit that in John 14, 15, and 16, a robust teaching by Jesus to his disciples about who the Spirit is, when the Spirit would come, and some of the things that the Spirit would actually do in the believers that he would take up residence to like acknowledge with Paul when he would say in 1 Corinthians 6, what, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that is in you? You have been bought at a price, therefore glorify God with your body. To believe in a hunger and a thirst for the Spirit of God who lives within me to walk in intimacy with Him. To invite the Holy Spirit to join us in our, in our communal gathering. A hunger for the Word of God. Hunger for the Spirit of God. Hunger for the people of God. For joining and gathering with God's people when God's people gather. It's such a powerful thing. I personally believe the gathering of the local church that's based upon the Word of God, like that is a supernatural gathering. It is a supernatural gathering. Why? Because as we said, first of all, we walk in the doors with the Spirit of God within us. We are temples, dwelling units, housing units of the very Spirit of God, but we also has a, have a promise from Jesus that where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. So supernaturally, we not only have the Spirit of God within us, but the Spirit of God among us to take up a residence. Like, do we hunger and I've been pastoring for almost, lead pastor for almost two decades. And it's just interesting in American culture and with American Christianity, for so many Christians, the local gathering of God's people has ceased to be a priority and it's simply an activity. And it's just one of many activities. And if there's not another activity on the docket that they would like to do more, then I think I'll go that date. Now, you're here today, so I think your actions are stating loud that, like, this is a priority. But I challenge us to hunger and to thirst for, for the things of God is to include the gathering of God's people, that it's not just an activity, but that it is actually a priority for me because I want to be where God's people are and where God's Spirit is joining in His people and is at work. Can I get an amen in the house? Okay, don't go to sleep. You're looking, I, I think you're tracking with me, but I'm trying to read you just a little bit. I'm interactive, so you can interact with me, right? Do you, Pastor Mark, yes, permission given? Amen. amen, there we go. Okay, good. So Jesus promises that when I'm hungry and thirsty, when you're hungry and thirsty for these things that bring the abundant life that Jesus promised, you and I will be filled to the full and have our hungry and thirsty heart satisfied. Now, I thought about appetite for just a moment, all right? If you know anything about an appetite, you know that once it is satisfied, it doesn't mean it will never come back again, right? You're hungry. I eat, I fill my appetite, I don't need to eat for the rest of the week. No, you're probably going to eat again that night, that afternoon. So we can fill, we can be filled, but I have an appetite, and it's filled, but then it will generate more of an appetite. And it is fascinating. I told the first service, oh, oh to have the metabolism of my 19-year-old son again. So he's gotten into weightlifting and he's pretty buff, if I could say that. I mean, like, I'm, I'm actually impressed, Mark. He, I stand amazed. And he's just at the age, at 19 years old, like, he walks around the, the house with his shirt off 95% of the time. I'm like, put your shirt on. Quit stopping in front of every mirror, right? But he tracks his food. And, I'm, and if I'm being honest, I'm actually a little jealous, too, because he really is pretty buff. So he tracks his food. So he goes, in these, he goes in these spurts. So he'll spend four months, and it's bulking season. I'm like, bulking season? Like, I feel like that's my life. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I got to work triple overtime just to not gain any weight. You're like, you're like, want to gain weight? Oh, dad, yeah. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Appetite. Bulking season. Um, he was in bulking season not too long ago. Comes out. Five eggs. A big pack of beef. A chicken breast. And I think noodles. I was like, Dad, I'm counting. I don't know. He's on his phone. This, this chicken breast with this season. Yeah, I got about 2,300 calories in this meal. I'm like, what? In that, yeah, and then I'm going to eat five meals today. I'm like, what are you, what? Dad, it's bulking season. And the other day, he shared with us, he said, at the height of his bulking season, he got up to 202 pounds. 202 pounds. I'm like, well, what do you weigh right now? He goes, well, I got on the scale because now he's in cutting season. And he's like, well, the other day I was in the scale. I was 178. I was like, what is wrong with you? How can you, can I like suck a little bit of that metabolism out and just give me an injection? Oh, to have an appetite like a young man, right? 
He he feeds it, and a few hours later, it's there. Now listen, all joking aside, from a spiritual standpoint, our hunger and thirst for righteousness is not to be a one-time deal or once in a while. Hey, I remember back in the day when I came to Jesus and I hungered and thirsted for righteousness. Man, that was really good. Now I just sort of do my own thing. In fact, the tenses in this particular gospel that Matthew writes for the words hunger and thirst are in the present active nominative tense. He's like, I don't know what that means. Well, I don't either, but for those who study it and who do know, it's in the present tense, which means it's ongoing. So you could literally say, those who are hungering and those who are thirsting for righteousness, it's ongoing. I hunger, I eat, I'm filled, but I want more. I'm thirsty, I drink, I'm quenched, but I want more. That's what the verse is saying. That's what Jesus is saying to you and to me today. So, first off, Jesus makes a promise to us that as we, if we, continually hunger and thirst for the right things, he will fill that desire. There's the promise. But let's look at the provision, right? So first of all, the provision for our hunger. Uh, John chapter 6, if you have your Bibles. I'll have these verses on the screen, but for those of you that have your Bibles with you in whatever format, go there. John chapter 6. While you're turning there, let me give you the context of what I want to read. I tell Pine Hills often, context always helps inform the text, to just read a verse and pull it out. You have to know what what happened ahead of time, what's going on in the moment, what happens afterwards. So prior to this, I'm going to read three verses in John 6, starting in verse 32. Prior to this, Jesus has fed thousands of people with five loaves and two fish. That's all they had. He blesses it. He breaks it, which that's a whole message in and of itself. And then he multiplies it. But it had to be blessed and it had to be broken before it was multiplied. There you go, Mark. There's a message right there for us. Right? So he does and everybody's filled and there's 12 baskets full left over. After that meal, miraculous meal happens, Jesus sends the disciples on their way. They get into a boat. They're making their way across the sea. As they do, a violent violent storm swept up. They were freaking out, scared for their life. I'm paraphrasing all of John chapter 6 prior to verse 32, okay? So they're freaking out, and in the middle of the storm, they look up, and there's a dude walking on the water. They freaked out even more. One of the other gospel writers tells us, one of the guys says, I think it's a ghost. And all of a sudden, it's Jesus. And they realize, oh, Jesus gets in the boat, calms them, gets them to the other shore. That has just happened prior to this. The next day, all the people that Jesus fed woke up, and they're looking for Jesus. Why? Because they want more food. But this is important. They want more food. They were the, they were the beneficiaries of a miracle of Jesus, and he fed their earthly appetite. So they wake up, and they're looking for him. And they finally find out he's on the other side of the sea. So they go to Capernaum and they actually find him again and they engage a conversation about, hey, feed us some more bread. So that's the context of the verses I want to read. So listen to what Jesus says in verse 32. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven because they were referencing the manna and when Moses was leading the children of Israel and how bread from heaven came down. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So this is the bread of life. Sir, they said, always give us this bread like the bread of life, and we can always be full, I'll take that bread any day of the week is in essence what they're saying. They were missing the point of what Jesus was saying. Then Jesus declared, notice this phrase, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. See, Jesus made a promise in the Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitude Here we see Jesus gives the provision for his promise, and he said, I'm the one and the only one that can fill your hunger. I'm the only one that can quench your thirst. I am the bread of life. And if anyone would come to me and believe in me, I will fill that hunger. So let me propose this to you. As the bread of life, Jesus didn't come to feed our empty stomachs. Rather, He came to fill our empty souls. 
He came to fill our empty souls. The people in this conversation were wanting something earthly. But Jesus said, I've come to give you something eternal. They were wanting earthly bread, and he was literally talking about giving them eternal life. So two thoughts off of that. Number one, Jesus, as the bread of life, has met our deepest need. Do you realize that? As the bread of life, Jesus, the Son of God, has met our deepest need. What is our deepest need? Our deepest need is to be in the right relationship with the God who created us. You see, you go back to the garden in Genesis, and we see that God's design and intent and purpose was for mankind to live in perfect, harmonious, unbroken relationship with the God who created them. And that's what Adam and Eve had. That was God's original design. But Adam and Eve broke that design when they were tempted and they fell into sin. And from Adam and Eve on, they have been handing off the football of the sin nature to every person born on the face of humanity within the human race, save Jesus Christ, who was conceived in a totally different and miraculous way. So we have a sin nature. That sin nature, as we grow older, produces sinful acts. That sin nature that produces the sinful acts has broken a right relationship with God. And whether we realize it or not, there is a deepest hunger in our hearts to be restored back to God. And so we try to do what we can do. It's usually called religion. Man's attempts to get back into relationship with God. But the problem with that is there's nothing that we can do to fill that hunger, although we try to fill that appetite in so many different ways. But God came running to us through the person of Jesus Christ, the bread of life, and said, what you can't do, you can't come to me, but I will come to you. Better than that, I will become one of you. And I will be like you, humanity, human, in every way possible, save one, I won't sin. I will then be qualified to die for the sins of humanity because I myself haven't sinned. Jesus is the bread of life. And he literally says, whoever comes to me and believes in me will have their deepest eternal need met. That is eternal life in Jesus Christ. And maybe, just maybe, on the ninth anniversary of Fairview Fellowship, today in this room, somebody is here and you have actually been on a hunger thirst, on a hunger search, and you've been looking to fill a hungry part of your soul, and you don't even know what it is, and today God is maybe perhaps revealing and showing you it's a need to be brought back into the right relationship God designed for you to have with him in perfect unity and harmony, and it is only through Jesus Christ, the bread of life, that if you believe, confess, and profess in that moment, you'll be restored to the right relationship with the God who loves you and the God who made you. Hallelujah. Take a big bite of that bread because it is tasty. I don't know. I'm on a sourdough bread kick lately. Is anybody else, any other sourdough lovers in the room? I don't know why. Like, I've just, for years I haven't had it, and all of a sudden I've gotten into it, and I'm like, man, I love that bread. It's tasty. You know what the scripture says? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you taste of the bread of life, it is sweet to the soul because it meets our deepest need. But can I also say this as well? Jesus, as the bread of life, will also meet our daily needs. He not only has met our deepest need, but he will meet our daily needs. Feasting on Jesus in the morning gives us nourishment that we need for the day. Can we just be honest today here? Like, we all have appetites. Apart from the Spirit of God within us, our, my flesh, your flesh, it has appetites. And left unchecked and left uncrucified, and we feed those appetites, they go haywire. And they lead us into all kinds of elements of dysfunction and separation. But when we crucify those appetites and we instead feed the Spirit and His appetite for the things of God, do you realize like, he, like His influence just grows within us? It's like we're starving the flesh and we're feeding the Spirit. Is it possible that maybe somebody here today is doing just the opposite? You're starving the Spirit and feeding the flesh. And then wondering, why don't I hunger for the things of God? Man, you have to feed the Spirit, and we have to starve the flesh. Jesus himself is the provision for our hunger. So when Jesus says he is the bread of life, he is reminding us he is 
the source of your life, the sustainer of your life, the supplier of your life, the security of your life, the safety of your life, the sanctifier of your life, the salvation of your life, the satisfaction of your life. So let me ask you again, are you hungry? Do you hunger for the things of God? Do I hunger for the things of God? Secondly, the provision for our thirst, right? He's the provision for our hunger as the bread of life. But what about our thirst? I'm so glad you asked Fairview Fellowship Church. John chapter 7, one chapter over. John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. Here's what John writes. As an eyewitness account to what happened here. Verse 37 begins like this. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice. So Jesus raises his voice with what he's getting ready to say. Pause right there. I think context really helps us better get this. This is the last day of a particular festival. What they would do on the last day of this festival, one of the priests would take a golden ladle, dip it in the water, they would parade right outside the temple gates, and there was a large rock, and the priest would pour the water over the rock. And they were remembering and memorializing when Moses, the first time, spoke to the rock, and out of the rock came water, and all of God's people drank water, and they survived in the wilderness." So they were memorializing that. They were mem remembering what God had done for them. So imagine the priest pours this water out. The people are all celebrating God's faithfulness to their forefathers. They walk back into the temple, and, and maybe perhaps as they're walking back in, in a loud voice, Jesus literally yells out these words. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Could you imagine what they just memorialized and they were honoring God and God providing living water to the people in the wilderness and all of a sudden here's Jesus and literally Jesus is saying, like, I'm that God. I'm the man. You're memorializing that, but I'm telling you today, if anybody comes to me, I'll quench your thirst. And on top of that, he said, then you will have rivers of living water flowing out of you. Like, that was almost scandalous for some people for him to say. We read it, and we're like, oh, yeah, Jesus. But in his, the context of his hearers, wow, what a statement that Jesus was making. So let me propose this. Jesus as the living water meets our eternal thirst. Jesus, as the living water, meets our eternal thirst. Jesus said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. He then said, whoever believes in me. So our eternal thirst, again, is quenched by belief in Jesus. And it's just a different way of saying that he meets, as the bread of life, our deepest need. As the living water, he meets our eternal thirst. So Jesus is the provision for our eternal thirst. However, let me lob this your way. In this particular passage, Jesus also gives us his spirit to meet our everyday thirst. So it's not just an eternal thirst, but there's an everyday thirst. The very next verse, John 7, 39, says this, By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. At the time that the event happened, Jesus was still alive. He hadn't been crucified. He, hasn't, he hadn't resurrected from the dead. But they were saying that once that happened and he ascended and then he sent his spirit the day of Pentecost to then permanently dwell in his followers and believers, not only did Jesus meet the eternal thirst, but now the Holy Spirit is poured into us, Romans 5, 5, it's poured into us, and we now have a well of living water within us to meet our every single day thirst. That the Spirit is there to help quench that thirst every single day. And might I propose to you, even on top of that, to understand all of the New Testament, not only is the Spirit there as a river to flow to us, uh, for our thirst, but the Holy Spirit is also there as a river to flow out of us, to bring life-giving words, life-giving actions, life-giving truth to the community that is around us. Like this is, this is what the living water of Christ has done for us, church. It's what he's done for me, and it's what he has done for you. 
We can have our thirst quenched every day through intimacy with the Spirit. As we walk, talk, commune with Him, because He is all about Jesus. It just strikes me that so far few Christians actually dig into this intimacy with the Spirit part, and yet the Bible says this is the very source of the living waters that are a well within us to go to. May we, as a church, be a church filled with individual peoples, but who, people, but who corporately as well dig into intimacy with the Holy Spirit, seek the power of the Holy Spirit, the leadership of the Holy Spirit as he teaches, guides, comforts, encourages, enlightens, illuminates, reminds, convicts, emboldens, directs, and leads us to the sweet waters of Jesus. And the more we drink from him, the more we become like the Savior. That is so beautiful. So I ask you, are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Jesus promises that if you are, you'll be blessed and you will be filled. And then he goes to the next step and says, and I'm the provision for that. I'm the one that will satisfy your hungry appetite. And I and I alone will quench your thirst. But we must be hungry and we must be thirsty. Now, as I close, right before I pray over you, I want to give you a challenge an encouragement. Hopefully the message has been a challenge and encouragement, but I want to give you a challenge and encouragement on your ninth year anniversary. What a thing to celebrate, right? Unbelievable. Praise God for his faithfulness. Praise God for the leadership's faithfulness. Praise God for your faithfulness. Amen? But the longer a church is in existence, the more inward focus it usually tends to become. It moves away from a primary focus of reaching the lost, not exclusive, but a primary focus from reaching the lost to Christ, and become simply more focused on taking care of the found. And while people growing in their faith in Christ is always necessary and important, we must never stop in that. Fairview, don't ever stop hungering and thirsting for seeing people give their lives to Jesus. There is nothing better. There is nothing sweeter. There is nothing more powerful. You realize that we in this room are God's plan A for reaching those who are far from God. And it is by God's design that we are his plan A. The evil one will work overtime to distract, discourage, disparage, and defeat the efforts of Fairview to reach this community. But fear not. You are operating on a promise from the head of this church, Jesus. Mark's the lead pastor, but Jesus is the senior pastor. So rest assured, those of you that want the senior pastor to be at every church activity, he's there. Pastor Mark won't be, but the senior pastor will be. Enjoying it with you, men's and women's events. But the senior pastor of this church has given you a promise, and here it is, straight from his mouth. He said these words, I will build my church. I will build Fairview Fellowship Church. I believe you're his church. So he has said to you, I will build my church, and the gates of hell can't even stop it. All hell could try and stop what's happening here, and it won't work. Why? Because of you? No, because of the senior pastor, Jesus, the leader, the head of this church. So fellowship, Fairview Fellowship, be hungry for Jesus. Be hungry to see more people give their lives to Jesus. Be hungry to see yourself and more people grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Be thirsty for the living water, Jesus. Be thirsty to see the power of the Holy Spirit unleashed on this body like never before in the life of Fairview Church. Happy nine years, Fairview Fellowship, and as good as it's been, the best is yet to come. Amen and amen. Now, let me pray for you. I'm excited. I might start coming up here on my off days, Mark. <laughs> what a joy. What a privilege. I hope, I hope in my deepest, deepest being, you don't take this for granted. But this is such a sweet, amazing thing to be a part of a life-giving church. There are so many places around the greater Fort Wayne area where people just show up, clock in, clock out. But to be at a church that is life-giving, 
where week in and week out, people are professing their faith in Jesus through believer's baptism, where people care about each other, where people who walk in riding a high, we rejoice with each other, as Paul said in Romans 12. And at the same time, when people walk in the doors and they've had a heartbreaking week, we can literally mourn with people. Like, this is so special, church. This is so beautiful. And what God is doing here is just absolutely nothing short of supernatural. And I hope that you embrace it. I hope that you celebrate it. And I pray to God that you never take it for granted. You never take it for granted. I would love to pray a prayer of blessing and protection over Fairview for the next season that you are walking into. All right? So whatever receiving looks like for you, a posture of receiving, would you do that? And I would like, love to pray this over you. Father God, thank you for Fairview Fellowship Church. Lord, I know that you called Mark and Chelsea to help lead this church, and there was a launch team. But God, we understand you ultimately are the one who planted this church. You, you had ordained for this church to come into existence. We thank you 10 years ago even as faithful men and women stepped out in faith, left the comfort of church homes and embarked on a brand new launch. So much risk and yet so much faith. And God, we praise you for your faithfulness for the last nine years to Fairview Fellowship. And I praise you for Fairview's faithfulness to you, to your word and to the leading of your spirit. Now, God, I pray first and foremost protection over this body of believers. God, we know what you design, the evil one always wants to destroy. So, God, we speak against any attempts of the evil one to try and destroy the efforts of Fairview. And instead, God, we ask for greater favor in this community, for greater impact, for more souls won, for more marriages restored for more wounded hearts being healed in the name of Jesus, for more young people to be brought to this church, that you would take the young people that are here and light a flame in their hearts, God, and may they carry that passion with them into their schools and into their colleges, and may they be salt, may they be light, may you start a fresh revival here through the youth. God, we pray pray blessing on Fairview Fellowship. We celebrate your goodness in all of this. So Fairview Fellowship, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And may you be in his peace, our Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless, church.